Hi everyone, welcome to week three of Cover to Cover Summer 2022. This week we begin our journey through the historical books of the Bible, starting with the book of Joshua, and today I will cover Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and 1 Samuel. Basically all of the historical books that detail the life of Israel before they um, become a monarchy. So let's begin the book of Joshua. Just a, a review of where we've been for the last two weeks. We were in the Pentateuch, which was the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, these books begin with what we called primeval history that contained the stories of creation, the fall, the introduction of sin into the world, then the pervasive nature of that sin and how it affects every person and every generation, culminating, of course, in the first big event, uh, the flood with Noah and God sort of resets. And then that primeval history ends with the story of the Tower of Babel, where humankind become scattered. Then we pick up the story with the patriarchs. This is the origins of the nation of Israel. So whereas primeval history had this universal focus, now we're narrowing down and looking at the world through the lens of the people we call Israel. This is their story and this is God's revelation to all of us by means of this nation of people. And of course, the story begins with one man named Abram who becomes Abraham and his family. And eventually that leads them to Egypt. That's how the book of Genesis closes with them in Egypt. And the book of Exodus opens some 400 years later <clears throat> with the people still in Egypt, but at this point they become slaves to the very, very wicked Pharaoh. Uh, so the beginning of Exodus details the rescue of the people from slavery and where God brings them via Moses and Aaron to the very presence of God at Mount Sinai. And I keep emphasizing this, but I want to continue to emphasize that the people that come out of Egypt aren't just the Israelites who were enslaved. It also comprises that group that comes out is also made up of other Egyptians, um, people from other you know, nearby regions that saw or heard what was happening in the confrontation between Pharaoh and God and decided to pledge their faith to God. And so they join in this exodus. So the group that ends up at the foot of Mount Sinai is not just the people that descended from Abraham, but there's other people that get folded into the mix. And we're going to see this as we continue through all of scripture and in these historical books, especially the folding in of other people. It's, you know, it's, this story is told through the perspective of Israel, but um, we'll see strangers and people from other countries become part of the nation. So God forms this kind of ragtag bunch of people into what he calls his chosen people. Chosen not because of who they are, because they're really kind of the least and last and lost of the ancient Near East at the time. Um, if he was going to pick the best and the brightest, he would have picked the nation of Egypt, you know, the other side of the story. But he picks the people that were Egypt's slaves, and he forms them into a nation for the purpose of making God known to the rest of the ancient Near East. They had a missional purpose. They had a calling placed upon them. They didn't just get, you know, rainbows and butterflies because God thought they were so amazing. But because God is amazing, he promises rainbows and butterflies if they will do what God has asked them to do, if they will live out their missional purpose. And there's a couple of things that God begins to help them in this process. So the first is the law. These are the terms of the covenant relationship with God. These, This is the way that the people are enabled to fulfill their calling. This is the way that God can then live amongst the people because God is so very holy and the people are not. And so they have to have this system of purifying themselves, making themselves clean so that when the presence of God is in their midst, they don't just burn up because they put their hand into the holy fire. Very important to understand that. This, the law is not God trying to be 
mean or oppressive in any way. It's God trying to set these people apart, make it possible so that God can live amongst them, because that is the whole goal. God wants to live amongst God's people and making it possible for the people to have, you know, some boundaries as they're living out this missional purpose. God also gives them a sacrificial system and a priesthood. Now, these are things that would have existed. All of this, law, covenant, sacrifice, sacrificial systems, and priesthoods existed in other ancient Near Eastern cultures. God's not starting something new for these people. He's just using the ways and means of the ancient Near East and reconstituting them in light of God and the relationship that God has with God's people. So the sacrificial system becomes the means of mediation between the people and God. The priesthood as well. Um, we're human. They were human. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to get unclean because cleanliness, as we talked about last week, had so much to do with, you know, bodily emissions and things that were just natural and normal part of human existence. Um, and so there has to be a way for them to repurify themselves and a way for them to atone for their sin so that, again, God can, can continue to live amongst them. And the terms of the covenant, if they are obedient, God promises them blessing, physical blessing. It's a physical covenant in the Old Testament with physical blessings of land, specifically the promised land, which we're going to get to today, and fruitfulness amongst the people. They will be fruitful. They were, their wombs will be open. They will have many children. Disobedience equals the removal of God's blessing, um, the removal of the promised land and of fruitfulness. And we are going to see the consequences that unfold in the historical books that lead to the removal of God's blessing from the nation of Israel. And of course, uh, we saw in the latter part of the Pentateuch, the actual journey to the promised land, which took much longer than it was supposed to because of the people's sin and disobedience and tendency to complain and grumble against God. Uh, but they are going to get there eventually, and that's where we pick up the story today. So here's a map of their exodus from Egypt. So you can see here sort of where they begin. They go this very roundabout route, not a straight shot. Um, part of it due to the fact that, you know, they had to wander because of their sinfulness. And then they finally end up coming right about here, poised on one side of the Jordan River, about to enter into Jericho. Jericho is their entrance point into the promised land. So just a quick overview of the historical books themselves. It's the story of the nation of Israel from the time of their arrival in the promised land to their return from exile. So spoiler alert, if you have not read or studied much about the story of Israel in the Old Testament, they are going to fail to uphold the covenant and they're going to be sent into exile but a remnant of the people will return from exile. It's not going to be what it once was. And we will, of course, talk about that when we get to that time in history. The primary focus in these books is on the nation as a whole or its leadership. There's not a lot of instances where we're diving down and just looking at like a typical Israelite living in this time and what was going on in their lives. We're looking at the nation, we're looking at its leadership, whether that be Joshua or Samuel or one of the kings. Um, there are a few exceptions, and I will try to note those as we encounter them. And certainly the entirety of the book of Ruth is an exception. Ruth is not, you know, a leader. She's actually not even an Israelite. Um, she marries into the, to the fold, if you will. So we'll look at her story here shortly. And the historical books really hit home with the importance of obedience and faithfulness. These are key to upholding this covenant relationship. Obedience, like I said, equals blessings for the nation of Israel. Disobedience equals removal of blessings. And those blessings are tied to the covenant. Again, it's the promised land and it's fruitfulness as a whole. Now, obviously, individual stories are not always going to line up with this. Bad things happen. Bad things happen to good people. That has always been true. Um, not everyone is able to, to be fruitful and multiply. All sorts of nuances exist to this kind of formulaic theology. 
And we will get into that when we get to the wisdom books, which are coincidentally my favorite part of the Old Testament. We will nuance this message and we will kind of dive down into, okay, well, but what is it like to really just be an individual trying to be faithful to God during this time? So hold those thoughts and kind of try to understand that this is really a larger view of the entirety of the nation. We're going to see that God continues to use faithful but not perfect human beings. No human beings are perfect and they are going to make mistakes. Even, you know, people who God says he loves dearly. Um, we'll see that in the story of King David. We are going to learn that foreigners can be part of God's family. We sort of already learned this, but it wasn't made super explicit with the people that come out of Egypt. Um, definitely in the law, God has lots of provisions for the foreigner that, you know, they are to be included. Um, they are to be extended mercy and grace. They kind of, you know, are to fall under the hospitality of the people at all times. And we're going to see that foreigners can actually become part of Israel. Israel itself is not a closed nation that is only available to people who, you know, have parents who both were both Israelites. And we're also going to see the importance of trusting in God versus the visual circumstances. This is a theme that goes all throughout scripture. So looking kind of through the books, uh, through the lens of the New Testament, always something we want to keep in the back of our minds because as you know, I am a Christian teaching this class and many of you are Christian believers. And so that adds a different lens to the way we look at these books. So we know from the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament, which we will get to in a short, in a, in a month or so, um, that obedience and faithfulness do not always result in an earthly reward for individuals. And in fact, in the New Testament, the covenant is going to be a spiritual covenant with spiritual blessings and spiritual punishments. We'll talk about that when we get to the New Testament. But we understand that blessing isn't like, oh, I followed God's law, so he's going to give me everything I've ever wanted. I'm going to get rich and have millions of children and there's never going to be any hardship in, in our lives. We know that that is not true. We're going to see it nuanced, like I said, in the wisdom books and also in the New Testament. Eternal reward for the New Testament is hope and an inheritance with Jesus Christ. Again, spiritual blessings attached to the New Testament covenant. And we're going to see through the New Testament lens following Jesus replaces the need to follow these kind of more strict Mosaic law that we see here in the Old Testament. So that a lot of that Mosaic law no longer applies to New Testament believers. The land of Canaan, I've talked a little bit about this, but just to reiterate that it, um, the geography of the land is not one that was suited for like millions of people coming in all at once. It's had lots of mountains and valleys, better suited for smaller cities rather than kind of one large city center. And so this is why you'll hear the argument from some scholars that they don't think like every, you know, all those millions of people came into the land of Canaan at the same time, but that it was kind of a gradual infiltration. Um, the Canaanites that were living there, uh, what happens to them after Israel becomes dominant? Well, it's believed that many of them migrated to what is now Lebanon and become known as the Phoenicians. So we'll hear the, that name in scripture. And the Canaanites were very, very wicked people. Uh, we haven't gotten to Second Kings yet, but you can look up those verses and it details the ways in which they were wicked. They engaged in human sacrifice, which was a very common practice in the ancient Near East. Usually it was the firstborn sons. There's actually archeological evidence of this. Uh, archeologists have unearthed big jars um, that were buried under like the threshold of a home with the remains of like prepubescent or early teen boys in them. So not just sacrificing like their infants, but sacrificing them like on the cusp of becoming teenagers. And they, there's evidence that these boys were buried alive because there's scratch marks on the inside of the remnants of jars that they found. So horrible, awful, awful. Um, they also engaged in divin divination, which is when they would kind of slaughter animals and look at their organs and analyze the lines on the organs for guidance. And they engaged in prostitution 
as a form of worship, as like a fertility ritual. And in fact, that's what a lot of scholars think um, that Rahab was one, one such prostitute. So these are very <laughs> wicked people. And we have to kind of hold that in our mind because there's going to be a lot of tough things to read as we journey through these books. The authorship and dating of Joshua, well, we believe that in large part, Joshua himself probably authored the book. Of course, as with every book in the really even the whole Bible, there's probably help from assistant scribes. In the case of Joshua, these scribes probably finished the book because we have um, a final account of Joshua's death and burial, which obviously he could not write himself. So there was an editorial process here and, you know, some people adding like a final postscript to the story of Joshua. The timing, probably written before the reign of King David, um, when we read Joshua 6.25, Rahab is said to still be living with the people of Israel. So we, uh, by that, um, if there's evidence the book was written not long after the events themselves happen. But again, there's portions inserted at a later date as editorial comments or summaries. So there's still this process of like putting together the various oral traditions, the whatever written records existed and kind of putting it all together into the larger story that we call the book of Joshua. So who is Joshua? He, uh, we know a few things about him, not a ton, but a little bit. He's the son of Nun. He was from the half tribe of Ephraim. So if you remember, that's the tribe of Joseph that instead of being called the tribe of Joseph is split into two half tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. He was born in Egypt he served Moses. So we find Joshua in Exodus at the mountain with Moses by the tent of meeting when Moses goes into the tent to meet with God. And Joshua is one of the spies that Moses sends it ahead of the Israelites into the land to kind of spy out the land and bring back a report. And if you remember from the story in Numbers, 10 of the spies are terrified and bring back a report of giants and that there's just no way they are going to be able to enter into this land. And Joshua and Caleb say, no, that's not true. We need to trust in God and through God, you know, we can do this. Originally, Joshua was named Hosea, which means salvation, but Moses changes his name to Joshua. And you, we've seen this a lot in the Old Testament where people's names get changed. Names were very significant. They had a lot of meaning. We'll talk more about this when we look at some of the prophets because their names usually have God somewhere in their name. Um, and so Moses changes Joshua, um, Hosea to Joshua, which means God is salvation. And this corresponds, by the way, to the name Jesus, the way it's pronounced and written, um, very much correlated to that. So he's kind of a pointing us forward to the Jesus that is to come. Um, he's depicted as a second Moses. He leads the people to victory in God's name and with God's power. In some ways, in many ways, Joshua's, Joshua's actually even better than Moses. I mean, he doesn't ever really seem to question God. God calls him to do things and yes, tells him to be courageous. So we assume that Joshua was rightly scared of what he was being called to do, but he never argues. He just does what God asks him to and, and remains faithful till the end. And so he's also a prototype of what an ideal human king should be for the nation. And we'll talk more about that next week when we look at the time of the kings. So an overview, what are the themes we find? Um, so we find, again, this idea of Joshua as being a second Moses. Um, and so pointing to like what ideal human leadership should look like. We find highlights of God's sovereignty here in Joshua, but also God's grace. And we see that in the story of Rahab and the Gibeonites. And then we have further revelation of what it means to be God's chosen people and the ways in which God provides for God's people. Just an interesting note in Jewish scripture, in their Bible, Joshua is actually included with the books of the prophets rather than with the historical books um, because they believe much of Joshua has a prophetic message to it and that the lessons in Joshua are filled with hope and instructions. So just kind of an interesting side note. The genre of Joshua. This is important. <laughs> it's a genre that scholars have labeled conquest literature, and it's it's really necessary to wrestle with this idea because a lot of Joshua features hyperbole. 
So this is called the genre of hyperbole. So what do I mean by that? Well, an example would be if I were to say to you that Astros annihilated the White Sox last night. For those that don't might not know, those are baseball teams, the Houston Astros, my favorite baseball team. Um, so we, I could say to you, well, they annihilated the White Sox. And you would know that I'm not saying that the Astros murdered everybody on the White Sox team. But perhaps someone from the future or the past that doesn't know context and doesn't understand even what Astros or White Sox are, they might see that word annihilated and it assumes that, that it means murder, you know, that they slaughtered these people. But we know it's an exaggeration. It's hyperbole and it's meant to emphasize the soundness of the victory. Like they crushed them. Like again, they didn't literally crush these baseball players into pulps, but they did really well. They achieved a great victory. It wasn't a close game, for instance. So what is hyperbole? It's that type of exaggerated statement or a claim that's not meant to be taken literally. Now that doesn't mean that there's not truth involved. And we see hyperbole a lot. We're going to see it in um, like Psalms and Proverbs where there's kind of poetry involved and more. It's, it's, very, it's a literary device. Um, and so we're going to see it again in scripture. But here it's not saying that what Joshua is telling us isn't true. It's that we have to interpret the truth with the genre in mind. So another example, my son's names are Carson and Palmer. And I might say to them, I've told you to clean your rooms a thousand times. I should really add, I have four children. I should add my daughters in here as well because they are all equally messy people as teenagers. So I, of course, haven't literally told my boys to clean their rooms a thousand times. I'm exaggerating for effect. I'm driving the point home that boys, you need to clean your rooms. It should have already been done. You haven't done it. Go clean your rooms. So there's truth in the statement. I have indeed at some point told them to clean their rooms. It's a rule in our house. They know this. So the exaggeration isn't meant to lie or mislead, but it's meant to add emotion and feeling. It's meant to convey, especially to the boys, that you need to go clean your rooms and I'm really mad at you that you haven't already. Um, again, I'm not picking on them. All my kids are equally messy and are usually very good about cleaning their rooms when I ask them to. So just a side note, I don't want my kids to think I'm picking on them. So understanding this genre is going to help us a little as we reconcile some of the very difficult material that we read in Joshua. It's not going to all the way make things better, but it helps. And it certainly helps us when there's inconsistencies because there are inconsistencies between Joshua and the book of Judges. So Joshua kind of leads us to believe that the land was inhabited. They kind of took care of everything that they were supposed to and all is good. And then we get to judges and there's still Canaanites living in the land. So clearly they didn't drive out everybody like they were supposed to. Uh, and so that, that discrepancy is because Joshua is again, this hyperbolic type of writing. So just like with all biblical interpretation, trying to understand this book, requires us to make decisions. We, we've got a lot of knowledge available, but remember all communication is underdetermined. So it can be difficult to kind of suss some of this out. We do the, the best we can with what we have available. There's also something that I haven't introduced yet called the mystery button. And I try not to push that button too often because I don't want that to be kind of the throwaway. Like, well, I can't explain this to you, so I'm just going to say it's a mystery. Um, I don't want that to seem like a cop out. If we push that mystery button, I want it to be because we've done due diligence, we've researched, we've looked into it, and at the end of the day, we go, all right, a lot of this is still hard to reconcile. We push the mystery button and we say, we're going to trust God with this one, and we're going to ask him about it when we get to see God in heaven one day. I'll talk more about the mystery button as we go. So Joshua has this geographical progression of events. The first 12 chapters deal with the actual possession and conquest of the land. Um, so it begins with the calling of Joshua, sort of reinstating people into community. Remember, they, um, they have to have circumcision and like have a pause before they actually cross into the land. Um, I'm assuming this is because they're wandering through the desert and just didn't have the time or the means to get that done. Also, they were 
quite unfaithful. Um, the, the whole generation that preceded them wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. So there was a lot going on there. So anyway, at the beginning of Joshua, um, everything kind of gets put right again. He makes sure that everyone's prepared to enter into the land. Um, this crossing is very reminiscent of Exodus. So it's almost like a following that same pattern. Um, the people cross the water, the water separates so that people can walk through dry land. Even when we get to the sin of Achan, I think that's chapter eight, it reminds us of the sin of the golden calf right after the people assembled at Mount Sinai um, and the need to, you know, renew the covenant. So Joshua ends with a covenantal renewal. So again, all of it sort of re-depicting what happened in Exodus. Um, again, there's conflicting accounts, that idea of all or every in the, in the Old Testament. So they'll say, all the land was con conquered, all the people were driven out. Um, but that's not, again, entirely true, because when we get to Judges, we see that there's still Canaanites living in this land. Um, some of it is due to the difficulty in transla translation. Some of it is due to the fact that eventually, yes, all of the promised land is possessed by the Israelites. By the point that the editors are putting their final touches on the book of Joshua, they are living in this land. Um, it's the time of the monarchs. They, are, they have full possession. But it took time. So, you know, it doesn't, it didn't necessarily happen all in this first generation of people that entered into the land. What kind of archaeological evidence do we have to back all this up? Well, there have been some excavations at um, sort of three major cities, Bethel, Lachish, and Hazor. And those excavations do indicate significant damage from the time period in which this conquest of the land would have happened. Um, interestingly, there's been excavation at Jericho as well, and there's not much there from this time period. Uh, you get two kind of veins of thought with that, where one group says, well, that's evidence that the Bible isn't really true. And the other group saying, well, all of Jericho is destroyed and devoted over to God. So it would make sense that we found nothing there. And then again, always this question of, is there a more gentle infiltration into the land where the people kind of split up and go their separate ways and it's, it happens over a period of time? Or is it like 2 million people show up and enter into the land all at once? Um, I think it's more gentle, again, because as we see in Judges, it's still not finished by the time of Judges, that complete takeover of the land. Chapters 13 through 21 deal with the division of the land. I cut a lot of this out of your reading because it is very boring and it is just dividing up the land and who gets what. <clears throat> and then the final two chapters deal with kind of the implications of possessing the land, like tying up loose ends. There's almost civil war, which we'll talk about in a minute, and um, a restating of the covenant. So here's a map of the conquest of Canaan. And so you can see here in the black circle is where they begin. They cross over. This is like the central campaign. And then there's a northern campaign and a southern campaign. So in the book of Joshua, it seems like everything's happening in chronological order, but there's much overlap going on with the various different battles. And that's going to be true in the book of Judges as well. So there's repeated comparison and contrast in really all of the historical books, but it starts here in the book of Joshua. We've got this repeated comparison between Joshua and Moses, which I've already alluded to. And there's a repeated con contrast between the Israelites and the Canaanites. The Israelites are small, in number, they're small in size. Remember the report from the spies that these Canaanites are these giants in the land, but they are faithful to God. And so they end up conquering. The Canaanites are large in number and stature. They're native to the land, but they're wicked. And so they are conquered often, not by the might of the Israelites, but by God kind of intervening supernaturally. But there's exceptions. We have Rahab, who was a Canaanite, and the Gibeonites, who find their way into the nation of Israel. And we have Achan, who is an Israelite, because of his sin, is destroyed. So there are exceptions to, you know, kind of Israel is great and Canaan is bad. So the theology of Joshua, 
God keeps his promises, and that's evident here. God has promised this land to this people. He promised it all the way back when he established a covenant with Abraham. It's been quite a journey, as we know, but God kept the promises he made to the patriarchs of our faith because of who God is, a God of grace. Land, as I've said before, fundamental to the covenant, part of God's promises, As I said, the signs and seals of the Old Testament covenants are physical. Land, fruitfulness in terms of like physical reproducing of children um, connected to the physical material world. That's going to be different than the New Testament. There's a practice called harem, which I'm going to talk even further about in a minute. But this means to devote or destroy in Hebrew. This was a common ancient Near Eastern practice. So when they would lay siege to a town... Um, the victorious nation would devote the people and possessions of the city to their gods. Um, Once someone or something, an entire city, was placed under this idea of harem, it could not be redeemed. That was the practice, at least in the ancient Near East. So if a nation said, if I conquer you, other nation, then I devote you, you know, put you under the curse of harem. There's nothing or no one that could undo that. So we see again that God meets people where they are in the Old Testament. He uses the practices that existed, but he reconstitutes them in terms of who God is. And so we have the story of Rahab and it becomes really important. It's unusual. It's significant because all of, um, oh my gosh, I just lost my train of thought. All of Jericho, sorry, couldn't remember the name of the city, is supposed to be devoted to God. And yet Rahab and her family are spared. This is a display of God's grace and a sign that um, God's way is much different than the ways of the ancient Near East. And so let me just pause for a minute because I love the story of Rahab. She is probably one of my favorite people in the Bible. A quick story for you. When I was going through the process of becoming ordained as a pastor, you have to do several interviews with like a psychologist um, because they need to determine if you're like mentally healthy and able to take on the role of pastor. And so you do a bunch of tests and then you meet like twice with a psychologist. And so the first time I met, I had no idea that they would ask me like any sorts of biblical questions. I was expecting questions about my background and things that had happened in my life and, you know, my mental and spiritual health, but not necessarily anything specific. No one warned me. Well, halfway through the interview, she says, well, who's your favorite character or person in the Bible? And I just, in that moment, panic. Like I can't even remember the names of people in the Bible because I'm just so unaware that this question is going to be asked of me. And so uh, my favorite story is Rahab. Um, She's the first, when I first started teaching Bible study, I, the first thing I spoke about was her story. And so I blurred out Rahab. And then as you are starting to learn, I, I'm a talker. And so I just keep going and I'm nervous. So that makes it worse. And so I go, well, Rahab, but you know, or no, the question wasn't who was my favorite. The question is, who do you identify with? the most? Who do you identify with the most in the Bible? Okay. So I say Rahab and then I say, but not in the prostitute sense, of course. And she's just staring at me. And then I am trying to make it sound better. And anyway, it was a super awkward moment. Also funny. And also you'll be happy to know I still passed my evaluation. So I love the story of Rahab and I relate to her story, not because of the element of prostitution, but because I did not come to faith until a little bit later in life. I was in my 20s when I came to faith. And so I kind of identify with her story in that, you know, she wasn't born into it, if that makes sense. She came to faith for herself. And so these spies come. This happens before they've even crossed into the Jordan. Um, Joshua sends these two spies this time, not 12, to go look over the land. And really, they don't come back with much of a report, but they come back with this amazing story of this woman who hides them and then says to them, um, she says in Joshua 2, verse 8, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. 
We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. So this is what I was talking about last week, that from the wickedness of Pharaoh and all of his evil intentions, God brought good. More people join the nation of Israel, including this woman, Rahab. So as we read about the difficulty of all this destruction and death that occurs in Joshua as part of the war and the battle and the conquest, we see this story as an example of grace. Rahab is spared because she verbally expresses her faith. And this is something that everybody in Canaan could have done. They had this opportunity. In fact, God waited a long time. Um, it was a slow progression through the wilderness, 40 years, you know. Then when he gets to Canaan, he can't, he has them camp out at the uh, on the other side of the Jordan. Then the conquest of Jericho itself takes seven days in which on any of those days, all the people could have waved the white flag and perhaps events would have turned out differently because God is showing that unlike the ancient Near Eastern practice where if something was devoted to Hiram, it couldn't be redeemed in God's story things can be redeemed because really all human beings should be devoted to harem because that is the punishment of sin and yet god has this gorgeous amazing plan of redemption for the people and here we see it encapsulated in this very story of rahab that's why i love her so much and amazingly we're going to see this when we get to the book of matthew rahab is actually one of the human ancestors of Jesus Christ. So that gives me chills right now. How amazing that this woman who was a Canaanite prostitute, the worst of the worst, with no status and no agency amongst her people, professes faith. She and her family are spared. They're brought into this nation of Israel and she becomes part of, you know, the ancestry of Jesus Christ. That is the story of redemption, and it's so powerful. So what else do we find in jo Joshua? We find this concept of rest, the theology of rest. Oh, I love rest, and I'm so glad that God makes it so important. And we knew this already because we've seen Sabbath emphasized over and over in the first five books of the Bible. But here we see that some of the um, ramifications, consequences of either blessing or disobedience isn't just tied to the people themselves, but to the land. So the land gets rest just like the people do. If the people are obedient, then the land and all of creation benefits from that obedience. So again, this idea that sin affects not just us, but everyone and everything around us, so does being obedient. And it that has even a more multiplied effect than sin does. And then we have the concept of covenant renewal. We've already seen this. We're going to continue to see it. Um, it just is the people resetting. Um, we're sorry, God, you know, for everything in the past, we confess and, and fall on our knees and we recommit to that covenant and to being obedient to you. So this concept of harem it is really tough to read, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, it's one of the difficulties we find in the Old Testament. It's one of the things that keeps people from wanting to read the Old Testament, and I totally get it. Um, it is tough to read about this all of Jericho, you know, being destroyed, because that includes animals, which are innocent. It includes children, um, which are, you know, yes. We all have this sin within us, but an infant hasn't yet had the opportunity to act on that sinful nature. And it's so tough to read. It should be tough to read. If this wasn't, if this was easy for us to read, that would not be good. Um, we're supposed to recoil in horror from what we're reading. So a few things <clears throat> that help us as we wrestle with this, it's not going to ever make it okay. Again, because it shouldn't, we shouldn't read this and think, oh, great. Um, but it does help us to try to understand what God is doing. So the culture, 
Again, as I said, this was the way of the ancient Near East. The people would devote other people and possessions to their gods. So a common practice that God is kind of taking and reconstituting. <clears throat> we also have this idea of progressive revelation. This is that the people's understanding of God grows as, as scripture continues on. We are viewing God and the world through the lens of the Israelite people in this moment in scripture. And we're going to grow right along with them. So their understanding and theology of God is going to develop the more they encounter God and the more their relationship with God either grows or fails. And so, you know, we'll have this, the wisdom books, which come along and add so much nuance as that process unfolds. The people of Canaan <clears throat> were very, very bad, wicked, evil people, and they had time. There was warnings. They knew what was coming. They saw what happened in Egypt. They could have any point had, again, waved the white flag and said, oh God, you know, we believe in you too. And we see that with the story of Rahab. Um, Israel's very existence depends on the success of these military campaigns. God at this moment in time is acting as their like human, like a human king would. Everyone in the ancient Near East had kingships. The Israelites don't have like an appointed king. They have Joshua, like their military leader, but they don't have a human king. They have God. It's, it's a theocracy. God is ruling them as a nation. And so God has to take on that role of, you know, anything that a king would do. And so <clears throat> it is war. It is military campaign and war is a horrible thing. And often as we see in our own times, innocent people suffer because of it. This is not a permanent concept. It's meant for a specific time, specific place, and specific people. This idea of conquest and entering the land and ravaging what's there is not repeated, certainly not in the New Testament. So this, again, is very particular to the time of Joshua himself. The reality of history is that they do not follow through with all of God's construction instructions. Yes, Jericho is destroyed, but that's because of God. That's because by a shout, all those walls come down. Um, you know, there's a few more cities where we see complete destruction. And then as we're going to find in the book of Judges, there's a lot of Canaanites still living in the land. So whether the people lost their taste for it or their faith faltered, they don't follow through as completely as the book of Joshua would suggest. So exceptions and warnings abound. Rahab's an exception. The Gibeonites also are an exception. Um, there were, you know, God does extend grace and mercy if someone comes and says, I believe in you, or I want grace and mercy, because the Gibeonites is pretty imperfect. I mean, they kind of engage in deception as a means of getting in, you know, being spared. Uh, but God recognizes that passively because God doesn't say, no, don't let them in. Um, the leaders decide, Joshua decides to accept the people, finds out that they were deceptive. They end up becoming like slaves of Israel, but God doesn't come, come along and say, oh no, that was wrong. You shouldn't have done that. So there was a way into the nation of Israel through faith. The next section is dividing the land. This is a time of rest. Again, God's concerned not just for people, but for all of God's creation. And there's just a lot of detail here, a record of the borders and territories. Um, here, I think we have evidence of something that was probably written very early on and then folded into this story as the record of exactly how all this happened. One thing to note um, is the concept of the city of refuge that we find that in chapter 20. And this is the idea that if there's an accidental uh, murder, like, you know, an accidental killing, um, you have a cart, it's dark, you run over your neighbor with your cart and your neighbor then dies. Well, the punishment for killing is death. This is what's handed down in the Mosaic law. But here God, again, has grace and mercy for these kind of accidents and has a place of refuge where these people can go so that uh, they can escape, you know, this punishment and um, 
live in peace amongst themselves. And then here's a map for the allocation of the tribes. Now, the one thing that's interesting to note is the tribe of Dan starts out here on the coast, but they are going to end up relocating to this more northern part. Um, so more on that in a minute. So implications of possession. Well, we have an almost civil war that occurs in chapter 22. Um, the eastern tribes, if you remember, got their territory before the conquest ever began. But they promised that they would come and fight alongside the rest of the Israelites when they entered into the promised land. And so once that that's happens, Joshua says, all right, you can go back to your families that you left on, on there. And so you can imagine how difficult that was for them as they're returning this idea that we're going to be forgotten because we're on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And so they set up this altar, really, I think, just meaning as a, a way of remembrance but the Western tribes take it in the wrong way. And so the civil war almost happens, but luckily it's averted and they make peace with one another. And then we end with a final farewell and covenant re renewal. Um, and so Joshua 24 is a very important chapter. It's got a verse that you might see a lot um, where Joshua says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And then three times he ch challenges the people. You know, are you going to serve God? Yes, we are going to serve God. No, really. <laughs> Do you know what you're saying? Are you going to serve God? Because I don't think you're up for it. No, yes, Joshua, we are going to serve God. Third time, yes, we are going to serve God. He says, all right, you're witnesses to yourselves of what you have agreed to. This is important because the punishments that come when they fail to observe God's law they took those consequences on themselves three times in front of Joshua. They said, we promise and we understand the terms of the covenant. We understand that we are, if we are disobedient, then we're going to have God's blessing removed for us. And depending on the way in which we're disobedient, there might be punishment for that. So the people are always made to be aware. There's always warnings or laws so that God makes it clear these are the boundaries. And yes, God is a God of grace and mercy, but God is not going to let people do whatever they want. There's also boundaries. That's part of being a God of justice and a God of love is that boundaries must be established and consequences must be followed through sometimes for the failure to meet those boundaries. Um, if you're a parent or a teacher or a leader in any way at work or at home, you understand this concept that we've got to put rules and boundaries in place because we love the people that are under our care or leadership. And it's our job to oversee that. And when, you know, there's times when we might extend grace when a boundary is broken, but there's also times where such a clear boundary is broken that there has to be some form of punishment for that. So we're going to see it unfold in the Old Testament. And it ends with Joseph's bones uh, being buried in the promised land. This is significant. It might seem like a throwaway final verse, but it's really important because if they can bury their dead in that place, then it really does belong to them. Um, you know, uh, otherwise they've kind of, Joseph's been in Egypt in limbo waiting, you know, waiting to put his bones in the promised land. And so they're able to bury him. That implies that they have possession of the land. So things end in a relatively good place. And then it all goes very bad. Um, once we get to Judges, quickly we, we read that after this generation that follows Joshua dies, that's what they mean by gathered to their ancestors, another generation grows up who knows neither the Lord nor what God has done for Israel. Um, it says, so Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the balls. So things are going to go really bad for us. Okay, so judges. I think I'm just going to keep going and try to get this all into one um, lecture. I think we can go pretty quick through the rest of this. So author of judges, we are not sure. There's no one named or mentioned, at least that I found. But we believe it is one main author, again, with editorial additions, as we've seen in the other Old Testament books. 
And there's three main threads that make up the story of judges. We've got the individual judges themselves, and some of them we get a little bit of insight into what was going on and their story. We've got this overarching formula of sin and redemption, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then we've got some miscellaneous additions, some of the crazy stories and really awful stories about what's going on within the tribes themselves. Uh, this book was written before the time of King Solomon, so pretty close to the date in which these things are happening. Um, chronology, not surprising if you heard me talk about numbers last week. When you add up all the numbers and dates of judges, the sum of years is about 100 more years than what it should be. Dates, we, again, there's just not a one-for-one -one correlation between dates and numbers in the Bible and dates and numbers as we understand them in our modern times. Um, the book of Judges, I spoke about this, supports an earlier date for the Exodus around 1440 BC. And the Judges, this is really important, overlap each other. So some of the chronology is that there is overlap going on. Um, each judge is a regional leader. And so Deborah and Barak, for instance, overlap the end of the judge judgeship of Ehud. Um, different parts of the land are experiencing peace or conflict at different times. So this isn't a chronological story, you know, one judge and then that judgeship ends and a new judge comes. They overlap each other. We'll see this with the kings of Israel as well. And so the question of judges is, what is the nature of this community of faith that God has has you know constituted now they are inhabiting the land they're where they're supposed to be roots are able to be put down what does it now mean to be a person of god what should it be what does it look like so the central problem in the book of judges is the cycle of sin Israel, the people continue to forget what God has done for them, how great God has acted on their behalf, and they end up forsaking God for the gods of the Canaanites, the little G gods. And in our eyes, reading the story quickly and with this overview that we have, we might think, how can you forget what God has done for you? God has done so many amazing miracles. How do you forget that and turn to these little idols, these golden and wooden, you know, facades that are these little G gods that have no power or benefit for their people? Peer pressure, living, uh, you know, the Israelite faith was so different from every other ancient Near Eastern religion. And there's, they did not drive out all the people as they were supposed to. And so there are intermarriages happening and there is influence going on. And it's just so much easier sometimes to give in to the majority than it is to hold your ground. And so we see this cycle where the Israelites um, sin in some way. This leads to consequences, which is oppression. Um, at some point, they will cry out in their oppression. That, that's the petition aspect. And they say, God, please help us. God raises up a judge to deliver them from oppression. And then they enter into a time of rest because of that deliverance. This cycle starts to unravel. And after the judgeship of Gideon, the land no longer receives rest at all. So it all really falls apart and they get stuck in just the sin and oppression. And they even stop the petition. So what is a judge? Well, their task is not legal, like we understand a judge in our modern times. Um, actually, legal disputes were presided over by elders of the tribe or family heads. The religious leaders and the religious leaders interpret religious law. So a judge is really a military deliverer. That is, it, it was specific and it was meant for a certain purpose and a certain limited time period. That's why we see different judges being raised up. Um, these leaders were very charismatic. They aren't necessarily selected by the people. Sometimes God just raises up a judge. Sometimes the people choose. And often that's part of the unraveling of the cycle. Um, as more and more the people become involved in cho choosing the judge, things go really wrong. Um, the judge was chosen to drive out the oppressor and to give rest to the land and to the people themselves. So what is going on amongst the different tribes? Um, they are, they're not 
it's more like a loose collection of states than a nation with central leadership. So the tribes are loosely related during the time of the judges. Um, some of this is because of geography and just the means of travel in those days. Uh, if you look back at the map, here, let's look. The, the people way up here, Asher and Naphtali and Dan, once Dan relocates, they're not going to be able to get down to help Judah in the wilderness if there's an issue or, you know, over here to fight for Reuben. So a lot of times the tribes would help their neighboring tribes, but there's not really like there's no central army, um, no central political leadership. And each judge kind of has a different one of these regions that they are judge over. Where was I? Um, so this proves, so also each tribe, back to my map, I should have put this closer, is going to have conflicts with the nation surrounding them. So depending on where you're living, you know, Judah is going to have a lot of issue with the Philistines. Um, the Reubenites are going to be dealing with the Moabites. Judah over here has got the Edomites. And up here, they're dealing with the Arameans. So not only are they separated geographically and by you know, just distance from one another, but then they also have their own battles to fight um, to protect their lands. And then there's internal tension between some of the tribes themselves, because again, human beings, sinful human beings, human beings who are losing sight of what they're supposed to be doing for God. And so they start to fight amongst each other as well. So all of this proves to be a big disaster, especially spiritually, um, because there's no national structure, there's no central leadership. God is supposed to be the unifying factor for the people. Worship and faith should be what ties them together. But even that unravels as the story unfolds. The covenant community idea lapses altogether. We don't see them coming together for worship like they should be or for festivals or for celebrating the Passover. And so it all gives way to just absolute abomination by the end of the book of Judges. So not surprisingly, because of this, there's a lot of difficult material to read about. Um, that some of the stories, like Jael and Sisera, where she drives the stake through his temple, Ehud with King Eglon is the very, um, he's copious king, that Ehud sticks the sword into his stomach. Just some very graphic and difficult things to read. Um, one of the most difficult stories and one that I get asked about a lot, so I'm going to just talk about it in advance, but we can also talk about it more in Zoom, is the story of Jephthah and his daughter. So remember, um, Jephthah at one point says, like, whatever comes out of my house, I am going to devote that to the Lord and who comes out to meet him but his very precious daughter. And the way the language is, it might sound like he's like going to kill her, that the devotion is, is actually like a sacrifice. And that causes us questions because we know that God does not ask for human sacrifice. So what is happening in this story? Well, the idea, because then remember that she goes up into the hills and cries and all these maidens join her and they're weeping for her, you know, lost youth kind of. Well, what we think is actually happening is that he is devoting her to service at the temple. Um, you'll hear talk or re read about women that served like, you know, at the outskirts of the temple. Often these were widows um, who had lost their husbands. And so then, you know, this is a means of, prov of provision for them to allow them to serve at the temple. But Jephthah's daughter is not a widow. So by putting her into service at the temple, she then is not ever going to have the opportunity to marry or have children. And so that's why she mourns with her friends. Um, but in fact, it's not thought that he kills her, but that again, she goes into service, lifelong service at the temple. So, you know, becomes like, like a modern day nun, if you will. And then we have the story of Samson and the Levite and his concubine. There's some interesting things to talk about in all of these stories. So I'm going to save some of that for Zoom. If you have more questions, like especially the Levite and his concubine, oof, that is a really tough story to read and very symbolic of how bad things got in the time of the judges. Uh, so there's in this difficult material lessons to be learned. Again, this concept of progressive revelation and not everything we read in the Bible is condoned. A lot of what we read is what not to do. Um, again, 
let's talk more about this in Zoom because this is one that I know you're going to have questions on and I think would be good benefit from like group discussion. So theology present in Judges. God is sovereign. Yes, indeed. Um, and we see that because again, God, you know, has the ability to raise up judges and to intervene in human affairs when God deems it necessary. God saves. We see this through the raising up of these judges. God forgives. God is so wanting to forgive, but that forgiveness requires some action on the part of human beings. You've got to repent and you've got to cry out. You've got to turn. Repenting is, the, is not just saying, I'm sorry, but it's literally turning to God, turning away from the path of following your own will and turning towards God to follow the path of his good and perfect will for us. And so we have to, you know, it's, it's not a one-way street. We've got to participate in this process. Um, God uses imperfect people to accomplish his purposes. Boy, is that not true in the book of Judges? Um, and we need God. Yes, indeed, we do. So again, some of the specifics of the judges' stories are really interesting. And so if you notice things, send me an email with questions and we can talk about it in Zoom. And so here, finally, I did tell you that Dan moves. So they move up to the very northern part of this tribal territory. Um, and it's talked about in Joshua 19 and Judges 18. Um, because they had constant pressure, as I said, from the neighboring Philistines, this is why they relocate. And they celebrate. Um, and where they are now is actually the border of Israel and Lebanon. So I have some pictures. I went to Israel in 2000. 16, 17, I can't, it's, I can't even remember anymore. Um, it's been a while, but I went to Israel and uh, with a class from my seminary. And so we actually went to visit Tel Dan, this very northernmost part. And here it's where the Jordan River begins. So here's the beginning of the Jordan River. And there's this beautiful pool that we sat by and we read Psalm 42. So just as an aside, a devotional exercise this week, if you have time, um, just think of this picture and read Psalm 42 and picture um, the psalmist writing in this set setting and hearing that roaring water of the Jordan River that's just out of sight. It's, it's actually, this looks so peaceful, but it's very loud. The water's quite, lo quite loud and pouring out his soul to God. Um, and then here's the entrance to the city. Um, the city gate. So any, anyone wanting to enter the city of Dan had to pass through here. So you can see it's very narrow and um, able to be defended. And here, just inside the city gate is where they would have what was called the judgment seat. This is where the chief elder of the tribe of Dan would sit and preside over the judicial affairs of the people. And then to the right, kind of out of the picture, is a long bench where the other elders would sit as well to help um, in the judgment. This is Abraham's gate. It's been covered to try to protect it from the erosion, in which you can see that has already occurred. And so that gray model in front of it is what it would have looked like in its prime. So you can see a lot of damage, of course, because it dates back to 1750 BC. So it's amazing that anything is left. Um, and we read about in Genesis that Abraham goes to Dan. Do you remember this? To rescue his nephew Lot. Um, and so we believe that he passed through this gate, Abraham's gate. So pretty amazing that that is still standing today. And then here is a view from the northernmost point of the city of Dan. So that road right here, and you can see there's a car on the road. That is the border between Israel and Lebanon. Um, and then if you zoom in or take out a magnifying glass, there's this white structure up here. That's actually a Hezbollah compound. And then this trench is left over from the Arab-Israeli war in 1948. So it is just amazing to go to Israel and see these layers of history on top of one another. And it helps a little bit to understand why there's still so much conflict in the region today, because it's just this continuing buildup of conflicts throughout history. Um, and that car on this road here was a UN peacekeeping car. So it was pretty amazing. This was my favorite place that we went to in Israel.
All right, so now let's quickly talk about the book of Ruth. It is one of my favorites, and it's such a breath of fresh air after reading all of the murder and mayhem. So it's written in the form of a short story. It was quite scandalous, a lot of daring and dangerous scenes, the uncovering, and she goes into the threshing floor and lays down at night. Like It's a little bit like a soap opera <laughs> in the Bible, which is kind of awesome. Uh, the author is unknown. Most likely it was written during David's reign. And the story takes place during the very, very dark days of the judges. So again, just a breath of fresh air and a, a bit of grace in the midst of so much awfulness. So some customs that are important to understand that help us understand the story better. There's a concept called kinsman redeemer. And we saw this in the laws given in Leviticus. Um, but if a man died and left behind a widow, his wife, then his closest relative was um, supposed to marry her. Um, the closest relative who had no son of his own. Um, actually, the relative could have a son. But if the woman, if the man dies and his, they have no sons, then a close relative must marry her. Um, and the idea being that then, so let's say it's the brother of this man. So I'm married to, well, I'm not going to use myself. That's creepy. Um, a woman named Pam is married to David. David dies. And so David's brother, Paul, then marries Pam so that she can have a son. And the son that Paul and Pam have would be attributed to the, the dead husband, David. So um, Paul would have no claim on that son. In fact, it would be considered a continuation of the deceased man's family line. So kind of complicated, um, but overarching, Jesus is said to be the kinsman redeemer for all of us. And it's not a one for one. It's not a perfect metaphor, obviously, um, but we can t we'll talk more about this. And it comes from this passage in Isaiah. And we can talk about this more in Zoom. And then there's this concept of ancestral land. So land always remained in the family. Remember back to last week, we talked about the, ju the year of Jubilee and that any land that had been leased out would return back to its rightful owners. Land remains in the family. Um, so the law requires that the next of kin buys back any land that has been leased into family ownership. So if David dies and he's leased some land for to, to make money, um, then Paul, his brother, has to buy back that land. So you can see that being a kin kinsman redeemer was quite costly and not necessarily something that they were keen to actually do because then they had to pony up money to buy their family's land and they potentially had to take on a new spouse. And sometimes these men already had spouses of their own. So you can imagine that that was just not, a, not fun for anybody. Um, so here is a map of the story of Ruth. So the family has to go to Moab um, because of a time of famine. This is common. We see this a lot in the Bible, relocation because of famine. Uh, Ruth, um, Naomi and her husband, they, ha they have two sons that go with them. The sons marry Moabite women. Makes sense because they're living there. And then um, all the men die. It's terrible, awful. And so Ruth is left widowed, no sons of her own. And she's got these two daughter-in-laws. So she says, I'm going back to my people to maybe, you know, try to eke out a living. Because if you were a widow with no sons of your own, survival was very difficult. You didn't have a lot of options. Prostitution was one of them. But for a faithful Israelite, that's not something that they're going to want to do. Um, or you had to just kind of fall on the mercy of your kinsman redeemer. So Ruth's going to go back, or Naomi's going to go back. Ruth decides she's going to accompany her mother-in-law the whole way. And so these two women show up back in Bethlehem um, and they're just hoping that God will provide for them there. Uh, so the theology that we find in Ruth, the importance of faith, Ruth demonstrates this, Naomi demonstrates this, like God is going to, to provide for us if we are faithful and, and, and live, you know, as righteously as we can. We see this concept called chesed, um, that's the Hebrew word that denotes like loyalty. It's like very strong loyalty, like covenant loyalty, loving just unconditionally, going beyond the call of duty. And so Ruth embodies this in her words, where you go, I will go, where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. So that's the ultimate loyalty. 
Um, so God does provide in the book of Ruth. He is continually guiding everything. He's everywhere in the story, but also somewhat hidden. There's not a lot of like actual mention of God's name, but God's providence is evident in the way that the story unfolds. What, what, what some people might say is luck or coincidence is meant to be attributed to the providence of God. And so we see that God often works through faithful people rather than taking direct action. God does take direct action, especially on a national level, as we've seen in the overarching story of Israel. But when it comes to individual lives, God works through us, which is what's so awesome about being a faithful follower of God is that we get to participate with what God is doing in the world. And we see that in the story of Ruth because God works through this wonderful man named Boaz to provide for both Ruth and Naomi. We see that God indeed welcomes everyone into the covenant if they come through faith. Ruth is a Moabite, but she marries in and because of her faith and she acknowledges his faith when she says, your God is my God to Naomi, she becomes part of God's story. And this is just only God can do this. I love this part. Boaz is the son of Rahab. And you'll see that in Matthew 1, the genealogy of Jesus. So Rahab, that woman who was not an Israelite, she was a Canaanite, but by faith got folded into the Israelite family. She becomes the mother of Boaz. Don't you know that as she was raising Boaz, she taught him to be kind and generous and welcoming to all people and anyone that would profess faith. So she raises this wonderful son who then marries a foreign woman because his mom was a foreign woman herself. And Ruth and Boaz also become part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It's so good. Only God could do this. It's amazing. So this family not is linked to King David and then also, like I said, to Jesus Christ. And of course, Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz don't know this. Um, they don't know that Jesus is going to come from their line. So they're blessed in the story. They have blessings that come to them, but there's blessings beyond what they know. And I love that aspect of God. Um, he, The blessings continue even after we're gone. Just as sin has like kind of outward ramifications, blessing even more so. Um, our stories continue through the people that come after us. It's really amazing. So here is a picture of the fields of Bethlehem. These are the fields where Ruth would have gleaned um, behind, you know, and where Boaz first noticed her and then agreed to be her kinsman redeemer. And these are the same fields where the shepherds heard the good news of the birth of Jesus Christ, who is our kinsman redeemer, the one who ransoms us and, and um, buys us back, if you will, into right relationship with God. It's, again, so awesome. I love when God does this, when these stories kind of collide with one another. All right, so let's quickly finish up with Samuel. Um, this was originally one book with 2 Samuel, but early in the Christian area, it was divided into two books. Both are authored by Samuel. Um, it represents, First Samuel represents the transition from the time of judges to the time of the kings. And there's a focus on people in this book, or, you know, rather than like geography, like in Joshua. So we've got some amazing people in scripture, Hannah, Eli, Samuel, Saul, Jonathan, David, Nabal, and Abigail. So just some great stories and people both good and bad that we find in the book of Samuel. Um, there, this is the beginning of big changes in Israel on every level, politically, socially, and religiously. The loose coalition of tribes that we saw in Judges is now going to become a nation with central leadership, and that's going to be both good and bad, as we will see. Um, so Samuel is the last of the judges, and he helps to establish this kingship. So who is Samuel? Um, well, he is the son of Hannah. And if you remember from her story, she is the second wife of a man named Penuel. She cannot have children, and so she continually prays for that to be true. And once it is true and she does become pregnant, she promises to 
devote her son to the Lord. And so she has this beautiful song that becomes like a foreshadowing of what is to come. Verses like, one does not prevail by might, and the Lord is going to give strength to his king and exalt the power of the anointed. And that's what we're going to see in the book of Samuel. Um, so Samuel has, in addition to being dedicated by his mother, he has his own direct call from God to serve as a prophet. And he serves God during a very dark time. The priestly system has been corrupted. Remember in Leviticus, we learned about all the rules for these priests. Well, by this time, Eli and his sons are breaking all those rules. They are, have grown fat off of the offerings, which means they're eating the fat of the sacrificial offering. If you remember our lecture from last week on Leviticus, this is a no-no. The fat always goes to God. Always. That is the best part, and it's supposed to be burnt up to the Lord, but they're eating it and growing fat because of it. And because of their awful leadership, the ark is taken into battle. It's taken out of the tabernacle. Again, like not supposed to happen. There's disastrous ramifications because of it. And so Samuel eventually will anoint Saul and then later King David to be the first of Israel's kings. There's a lot of contrast that occurs in Samuel between the, the people that we find in the book. We have Eli and his sons who are the priests, who are leaders, who have high status, but they disregard all of God's laws. And then you have Hannah and Samuel who are really just, you know, ordinary people, no special status. Hannah's a second wife. Uh, but they are faithful. And because of that, Samuel rises in status and Eli and his sons lose their status and in fact, their lives. We have Saul, who is crazy, <laughs> literally. We'll talk more about this next week. Prideful, arrogant, but has the look of a king versus David, who's courageous and humble and merciful, at least at the beginning. More about him next week. Uh, but doesn't quite look as kingly as Saul. Um, and so there's a lot of contrast between those two. And then we have, I love the story of Nabal and Abigail. Nabal is this awful fool and fool means like someone that does not believe in God versus his wife, Abigail, who is wise. And so um, helps King David and prevents him from sinning greatly by killing Nabal. We see a lot of reversal of status. This is true throughout the Bible. Um, the so person that should inherit everything doesn't, and the least and the last and the lost inherit everything. Uh, Jesus is going to say this himself to his disciples. And so here in First Samuel, we see that David is anointed to be king, and that, and because of Saul's transgression and sin and pride, God's spirit and hand depart from Saul. Um, and there's some difficulty here in the wording it, because. It says that this, there's an evil spirit sent by God and then removed, you know, to kind of plague Saul, if you will. That's a muddled translation. The verb there is a passive tense. So it's not that God, again, because God is, is not the author of evil or bad things. God is removing like his hand of blessing and anointing. And because of that, then the evil spirit takes root in Saul. Let's talk more about that in Zoom because I'm sure you will have some follow-up questions about that. Um, David is said to be a hero for slaying Goliath, and but yet he's forced to flee from Saul's wrath because Saul loses his mind. Um, but David remains respectful towards Saul and ends up sparing Saul's life twice. So we see this reversal of outcomes. The younger brothers are often chosen over the elder brothers. Why? Because God's here demonstrating his sovereignty and power. Um, just like the, the nation of Israel was formed from like slaves and kind of the least and the last of the ancient Near East, rather than Egypt, which was the ruling nation of the ancient Near East. Here we see younger brothers get chosen over their older brothers. And that is a theme that continues throughout. We've seen it in the story of the patriarchs as well. And we're going to continue to see it in the story of the Old Testament. So the transition to the monarchy, the people say to Samuel, give us a king. And in fact, the very end of Judges blames what has happened in Judges 
on the fact that, that Israel doesn't have a human king. So instead of like taking responsibility for their own transgression, they say it would all be fine if we had a human king like everybody else does. Um, and so they feel like the monarchy is necessary for their survival. Everybody else around them has a king. But in 1 Samuel 8, 11 through 20, God warns the people, like, are you sure what you're asking for? Because now your government's going to be centralized. You're going to have to pay central taxes. You're going to be tran transcripted to fight in a central army. You're, you're not going to have as much autonomy as you did during the time of judges. And the people say, yes, we don't care. This is what we want. Um, so this is, you know, they started out as a theocracy. God was their king and they had, you know, they had this tribal rule. Now they're going to become a monarchy with centralized rule from a human king. But it's not monarchy like we find in the rest of the ancient Near East. It's theocracy through monarchy. So God is still overarching. The king of Israel is the servant of God. So unlike other ancient Near Eastern kings, the king of Israel is not considered to be a god himself. In the other ancient Near Eastern regions, they were. So like Pharaoh was considered a god. The king of Israel is never given that status. It is recognized that he serves the one true God. He's another intermediary between the people and God. So that's very different from the rest of the ancient Near Eastern world. So that brings us to the end of our lectures. I know I did not really talk about Saul and David at all. More on them next week. I will really get into like their stories and what happens. Um, so much that we've covered. I know you're going to have some questions this week, especially about some of the di more difficult things to read or just some of the interesting stories that we can, that we find in these books. So let me know via email if you have questions. Um, and I will be sending, of course, our discussion questions as well that we can go over in Zoom. So let me close with prayer. Gracious God, just thank you for, again, bringing us together to study your word, bringing us in community. And God, just help us to have wisdom and insight to be able to apply this to our lives in a meaningful way and that your Holy Spirit would work through this Bible study to transform our hearts and the ways in which we serve you. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen, and I will see you at Zoom.